1997, Stargate returned, not to the cinema screen, but to the television screen, in the form of Stargate SG-1. The show rode success for five years, garnering a passionate fanbase who now saw the series as the definitive incarnation of Stargate, superseding the original movie. It was quite a shock to these fans when at the end of its fifth season, the show was cancelled by its original network and one of its main cast members departed the series. If any other series was dealt such a blow, it likely wouldn't have survived. But Stargate SG-1 wasn't any other show. And remarkably, not only did it survive, it thrived. While Stargate SG-1's ratings were slowly declining over its first five years, this wasn't the true cause of its cancellation, as most long-running TV shows usually see a ratings decline. The chief reason was plateauing subscription numbers. Stargate's network Showtime was a premium cable channel, and so a good chunk of its revenue came from paid subscriptions as opposed to advertising. Stargate SG-1 had initially brought in a subscriber boost for the network, but this steady stream gradually slowed to a trickle. Showtime attempted to make up the difference by syndicating SG-1 to other networks, but by the fifth season, Showtime believed the series had stagnated. However, it was thanks to Showtime syndicating the show that SG-1 was quickly renewed, as one of the recipients of the syndication package was the Sci-Fi Channel. The Sci-Fi Channel began life as a home for reruns and the occasional schlocky B-movie, but at the turn of the millennium, the channel made a push for original programming, commissioning expensive productions like Frank Herbert's Dune and Farscape. Reruns of SG-1 had been very successful on the channel, and so when SG-1 was dropped by Showtime, the Sci-Fi Channel was happy to step in and add SG-1 to its growing roster of original programming. In many ways, the Sci-Fi Channel proved to be a more suitable home for SG-1. Showtime, being a premium cable network akin to HBO, often aimed its programming strictly towards adults, as opposed to the more family-friendly adventure series SG-1 would become. Even so, SG-1 initially tried to fit the expected mold at Showtime, featuring nudity and violence in its premiere episode, which feels very jarring in retrospect. The Sci-Fi Channel, however, was much broader with its programming. Stargate SG-1 could not only fit comfortably on the cable network, but even pull in new viewers who may not have been able to fork out the cash for a Showtime subscription. For the time being, the Sci-Fi Channel appeared to be the ideal new home for Stargate SG-1. A more complicated problem to solve, however, was the departure of Michael Shanks as Dr. Daniel Jackson. Though the actor was convinced to return for a handful of one-off episodes, it was clear SG-1 needed a new member. Thankfully, this new member already presented themselves at the end of Season 5. Jonas Quinn, played by Corin Nemec, was introduced in the episode Meridian. Despite Corin Nemec only being one year Michael Shanks' junior, the character Jonas Quinn is clearly intended to be much younger than the rest of SG-1. This creates a new dynamic between Quinn and the rest of the cast. Whereas Jackson was an equal colleague to Colonel O'Neill, Quinn has to work hard to prove himself. Quinn also forms an unlikely bond with Teal'c, as the two can relate to each other as outsiders to Earth culture and custom. In a sense, Teal'c takes on the role of Quinn's big brother on the team. Meanwhile, Carter bonds with Quinn over their shared love of science. This is quite a refreshing change after Daniel Jackson gradually adopted O'Neill's sardonic temperament and lost some of his wide-eyed enthusiasm for SG-1's adventures. Because of this, Jonas Quinn's easygoing attitude and childlike curiosity are welcome additions to the show. It's just that it's my first time in space. Uh, we'd only begun to consider the possibility of space travel to actually be out here is... It's amazing. Indeed. Overall, Jonas Quinn successfully avoids the trap of being Diet Daniel Jackson and instead carves out a unique presence in the show. 
Despite his many strengths, what lets Jonas Quinn down as a character is his lack of development throughout the season. His introduction is well handled, and his dynamic with the rest of the team is interesting, even refreshing, but there are few great Jonas Quinn-centric episodes. For the most part, Quinn is a solid supporting character, but never feels truly equal to the main cast. There is, however, the hint of some greater potential. During a clash with the system lord Nearty, there's the revelation that Quinn's DNA is somehow different than other humans. You're not human. I'm human. I'm just not from Earth. Those few thousand years on another world have changed you more than you know. Whether this was meant to hint at a larger arc for Quinn in the future is unclear, but ultimately, due to this lack of development, Jonas Quinn comes off as likeable but bland. There may have been potential for more, but unfortunately we'll never know. The reasons for this will be explored later. Despite SG-1's renewal on sci-fi coming with a slightly reduced budget, Season 6 opens with a bang in the two-parter Redemption, which sees the SGC and the Rebel Jaffa in their first major confrontation with Anubis. I said previously that despite how effective the Goa Old are as recurring villains, as characters few of them surpass the presence of Ra in the original movie. That is, with the exception of Anubis. Whether it was a conscious effort by the writers or not, the greater sense of threat from Anubis comes as a result of remixing two of Stargate's best villains into a new character. Part of what made Ra so effective in the original movie was a sense of the unknown, something which isn't present with parasitic snakes. Anubis, being a partially ascended being with remarkable powers, retained some of that cosmic mysteriousness which the system lords following Ra lacked. Then there's the character's appearance. At first glance, Anubis broadly resembles Sokar with his dark robes and calmer speaking voice, elements which made Sokar feel quite chilling which carry over to Anubis. While other system lords are essentially outer space tyrants with a cool aesthetic, Anubis feels like a genuinely powerful cosmic threat. That threat is properly communicated in the sprawling epic that is Redemption. Not only do we get some more Stargate warfare, with Anubis turning the SGC's Stargate into a bomb, but Teal'c also leads a raid on one of Anubis's bases with the help of Braytac and his son. Not only does this plotline pack in some good old-fashioned Stargate action, but it also features some great drama. After the sudden death of his wife, Teal'c fights to repair his relationship with his estranged son, Ryak. Everything I have done, I have done for you. And I am ashamed, for you have done nothing but bring pain and misery and above all, false hope to countless Jaffa. Then fire your weapon. Christopher Judge delivers yet another richly emotional performance in the episode, especially in the scene where Teal'c and his son finally make amends. Whether you believe in me or what I have chosen to do does not change the fact that I have never doubted your heart, Ryak. You need never win back my trust, my son, for you have never lost it. The climax of the episode is a nail-biting set-piece, which sees O'Neill propel the unstable Stargate through a hyperspace window just in the nick of time, a plan which only succeeds thanks to Jonas Quinn's help, which secures him a place on SG-1. Stargate SG-1 couldn't have hoped for a better start to its new life on the Sci-Fi Channel, kicking off the season in spectacular fashion with thrilling action, creative plotting, and moving character drama. Redemption is also notable for the introduction of the F-302, humanity's first space-capable fighter. The F-302 is emblematic of another core strength of Stargate SG-1 as a series, which is the satisfaction the viewer gets from slowly seeing humanity transform into a space-faring civilization. In their first year of adventures, the Stargate was the only piece of advanced technology at the SGC's disposal, but by its sixth year, Earthlings, or the Tauri as they are known to the rest of the galaxy, have gone from underdogs to a burgeoning galactic power. 
Thanks to the remarkable consistency of the show's internal logic and continuity, this thread feels extra rewarding for fans who can pinpoint the exact episode that Tauri acquired new technology and how it has been reverse engineered over the course of the series. The F302 is the culmination of one thread, but the truly grand payoff comes in the episode Prometheus. When Carter has a run-in with an investigative journalist on the cusp of uncovering the Stargate program, the Pentagon offers the journalist and her team a once-in-a-generation exclusive for their latest project, the X-303 aka the Prometheus. Earth's first interstellar spacecraft. Naturally, things go haywire when it turns out the journalist's team are operatives working for the Trust. Al, why are you doing this? They're paying me. We're supposed to be friends. They're paying me a lot. Who promptly hijack the ship and take it into orbit, leading to some die-hard style space-based action. The Prometheus itself continues the show's strong track record of outstanding design work. The aforementioned F-302 not only looks fantastic on screen, but it perfectly symbolises the history behind its creation. It's the shape of a go-old death glider, but with the colour scheme and detailing of a modern-day fighter jet. The Prometheus, on the other hand, looks like a modern-day Navy destroyer which has somehow sprouted rocket engines. The bulky shape of the thing also alludes to its origins, resembling less a spacecraft and more a titanic fortress. This is a design feature which future Tauri spaceship designs would further lean into, with the later Daedalus class looking like something halfway between a gothic cathedral and an outer space warship. So what didn't they go for? The name I suggested. For the ship? Yeah. Yeah. Sir, we can't call it the Enterprise. Why not? While Prometheus is a great piece of standalone action fun, its follow-up unnatural selection veers into darker territory. Immediately after recapturing the Prometheus, Thor appears on the bridge and asks for SG-1's help in once again fighting the Replicators, who have taken over the Asgard world Hala. After offloading their unwelcome guests, SG-1 travel to Hala to activate a time dilation device to trap the replicators there forever. Unnatural Selection is another great example of SG-1's trademark ingenuity, but it's also an example of some atypical darkness. There's some truly striking imagery when the Prometheus touches down on Hala, its surface having been flattened by the replicators who have harvested all raw materials. The foreboding atmosphere created by the sight of this eerie landscape and the sound of distant thunder is intensified further when the team discover... Sir, you're not gonna like this. And when SG-1 encounter a new form of replicator... If you haven't noticed, this entire planet is paved with replicators. We are aware of this. We cannot allow you to stop them, I'm afraid. Why not? We are replicators. At first, this new step in replicator evolution would appear to be a step backwards. After all, part of what made the replicators so threatening was their unrelenting, swarm-like nature. Having such an enemy evolve into a more fallible human form risks undermining the danger they pose. However, this is quite intentional as the episode manages to combine its ingenuity and its darkness into a thrilling but disturbing climax, when Carter and O'Neill trick the replicator known as Fifth into letting them go. So, set the timer for... five minutes. It's cutting it awfully close, sir. I know that, Major. This turn of events builds on a similar idea seen in the previous season's Menace, where the burgeoning humanity of these cold machines is used against them. They're escaping. There's still two minutes left. No, my son. They've made a fool of you. They won't leave me, she promised. Although SG-1 may have escaped for now, they would soon come to confront the consequences of this troubling act. He used his humanity against him. He wasn't human. Get that through your heads. He could have fooled me. Another significant departure from Stargate's usual fare comes in the episode The Changeling. Teal'c wakes up from a strange dream, 
only he has no forehead tattoo and no symbiote. In fact, he seems to be a perfectly ordinary human firefighter named T. What follows is an esoteric trip through dreams and reality as Teal'c constantly shifts between his life as a member of SG-1 and his other life as a firefighter. Something's wrong. He knows it. What is happening? I'm sorry, Teal'c. I didn't mean to wake you. The episode itself was written by Christopher Judge, who uses the opportunity to show off his acting range by switching constantly between the stoic warrior Teal'c and the laid-back emergency serviceman with a heart of gold, T. By this point in the series, Judge is so familiar as his Stargate character that it's almost jarring to hear him speak with a normal human voice. The rest of the cast are also clearly enjoying the opportunity to stretch their acting muscles. The viewer is left constantly guessing as to what is really happening here, with a brief shot of Teal'c and Braytac in the aftermath of a battle providing a possible clue. But it isn't until T talks to Daniel Jackson, appearing as a psychologist of the same name, that the truth presents itself. If you can't distinguish between them, if the one seems equally as real as the other, maybe you don't belong in either one. In some ways, the episode could be compared to Deep Space Nine's Far Beyond the Stars, at least in presentation if not in subject matter. But whereas the DS9 episode ended its story on an effective, ambiguous note, the Changeling's final revelation is more definitive and therefore a tad disappointing. The twist is a clever one, and Teal'c is significantly changed by the events, but unfortunately this reveal can be summed up by the phrase, it was all a dream. Even so, the dream is certainly a fascinating one, which affords the cast and crew the opportunity to step outside their comfort zones and experiment with the show's format. While the episode may abruptly rein itself in by the end, the Changeling is still memorable for that brief moment it was let loose. Soon after the Changeling, SG-1's sixth season comes to an end in full circle, which at one point was intended to end the series itself. Executive producers Brad Wright and Robert C. Cooper planned to wrap up SG-1 after six seasons. The original plan was for Stargate to return to the big screen in an SG-1 movie, which would set up a new spin-off show. In a sense, this would take Stargate in the same direction as Star Trek in the late 90s. Just as the Next Generation crew continued their adventures on the big screen while Deep Space Nine and Voyager expanded the Star Trek mythos on television, so too would the SG-1 ensemble lead a series of movies, while a new spin-off show would entertain audiences on television. The SG-1 movie would never see the light of day, however, as SG-1 the television show was renewed for a seventh season. The show was a rating smash for the Sci-Fi Channel overtaking Farscape as the channel's most watched regular series. Due to the expense of a theatrically released feature film and the support from the Sci-Fi Channel, MGM, Wright, and Cooper ultimately decided to continue SG-1 on the small screen, folding in their ideas for a movie into the seventh season. Season 7 would see yet another shake-up to the show, or, depending on how you look at it, a return to the norm, as Michael Shanks rejoined the cast as Daniel Jackson. Soon after leaving the show, Shanks was allegedly quite surprised by the vocal fan reaction to his departure. After all, his main reason for leaving was a sense that his character wasn't all that important anymore, so to see such a reaction came as quite a shock. Although he was no longer a regular cast member, Shanks was able to make several guest appearances throughout Season 6. During each return trip to the SG-1 set, Shanks was reminded of how much he enjoyed working with the cast and crew, who had grown close after over half a decade together. In a relatively short amount of time after leaving the show, Shanks and his representation entered negotiations to return to the series. Daniel Jackson being such a popular character among fans meant the showrunners were receptive to the idea. However, the possibility of adding an additional cast member's salary to the show's budget and allegedly quite a handsome one at that, meant writing Jonas Quinn out of the show in order to return Dr. Jackson to SG-1. One can't help feel a little bit bad for Corin Nemec, who was just beginning to find his feet, and whose character had some great potential. However, Nemec understood the reasons for the change, and departed the series on good terms with the cast and crew. Thus, in the aforementioned season 6 finale Full Circle, 
Jackson, in his ascended form, is punished when he tries to intervene in corporeal matters by stopping Anubis attacking Abydos. As punishment for his crime, Daniel is transformed back into a regular human being, and the knowledge he gained while ascended is erased from his mind. In Season 7's two-part opener Fallen and Homecoming, Daniel reacquaints himself with his old life, while SG-1 races to stop Anubis from acquiring a powerful new weapon from Jonas Quinn's homeworld. The two-parter deftly balances Daniel's return and Quinn's departure, without either element subtracting from the other. Ironically, the brief time Jackson and Quinn work together on screen showcases how great these two could be together as regulars. Although Quinn found a bond with Teal'c and Carter, his work alongside Daniel Jackson is the first time he comes across as a genuine equal to any other member of the team. Okay, do some kind of a uh, keyword search? Yeah, for what, Achilles? Well, that's good. I'm glad to see that your, your memory's finally coming back, not to mention your razor-sharp wit, but why don't we try something like uh, uh, power core venting? In the end, Jonas' return to his home world is tactful rather than rushed. While he never became all that close with SG-1, he was a steadfast ally, and his arc is given a fine conclusion. Ah, uh, you earned it. Thanks. And not a second after Quinn has left, SG-1 is back, the way fans know and love. It's not that I mind rejoining SG-1 and exploring the galaxy, meeting new cultures, Jeopardy, saving the world, that kind of thing. We get paid for this, right? Despite this initial feeling of business as usual, which characterizes many standalone episodes in the first half of season 7, the second half of the season ramps up the threat of Anubis with the introduction of the Cull. First introduced in the two-parter Evolution, Teal can Braytac come across the aftermath of a recent battle. At first, they believe it to be the result of a System Lord rivalry, only for the true perpetrator to reveal himself. Though initially intimidating in the original movie, after seven seasons, the Jaffa could be likened to the stormtroopers of Star Wars. Cannon fodder enemies who can barely hit the broadside of a barn and are easily dispatched with a healthy spray of bullets. This is a weapon of terror. It's made to intimidate the enemy. This is a weapon of war. It's made to kill your enemy. This is why the Cull Warriors are so effective in their introduction. Not only are they borderline invincible, but what lies beneath their armor is truly horrifying. The Cull are not inhuman, but abhuman. Things given just enough life to understand how to take orders and how to kill, but little else. They appear not as corpses, but creatures who never fully formed. I serve Anubis. While their introduction in Evolution is a memorable one, the conclusion of the two-parter becomes sidetracked by a hostage plot in South America. The Cull's best episode, in my opinion, comes later in the season in Death Knell. When the Alpha Site comes under sudden attack from Anubis's forces, Jack and Teal'c are sent to find Carter, who is missing in action. The highlight of the episode is Carter's predator-inspired contest with the pursuing Cull warrior. While Carter is highly competent, being as handy with a machine gun as she is with a microscope, Death Knell shows us a side of the character we rarely get to see. Alone, in the field, with no gadgets or weapons, Carter has nothing to rely on to survive but her own wits and resourcefulness. It's always great to see Stargate go gritty with its action, and it's no more effective than in Death Knell, which has some truly nail-biting moments. In these wordless stretches, the episode resembles the excellent Who Monitors the Birds from Space Above and Beyond, but much of Death Knell's runtime is taken up by the B-plot of the Tok'ra and Free Jaffa ending their alliance. 
This is an important story turn, building on the tension between the two factions first seen in the previous season's terrific episode Allegiance, and there's also rich material for Jacob when he realises the Tok'ra leadership have cut him out of decision-making. There's also a logic in pairing these events with the down-and-dirty desperation of Carter's plotline. However, the two halves of the episode ultimately end up distracting from, rather than reinforcing each other. That being said, it's still a captivating showcase of Samantha Carter's character, and another demonstration of the threat posed by Anubis. Season 7 concludes with what would have been the Stargate SG-1 movie, Lost City. SG-1 races to mount a defense of the Earth before Anubis arrives to conquer the planet. This quintessential Stargate adventure echoes the Season 1 finale in its basic premise, but in doing so, it only serves to highlight just how far humanity has come since. Whereas Earth was virtually helpless in the Serpent's grasp, Perhaps when the warships of your world attack, uh, we'll be able excuse to... Excuse me, did you say the ships of our world? Surely you have such vessels. Well, we have a number of... of... Shuttles. shuttles. These... shuttles. They are a formidable craft. Oh, yeah. In The Lost City, we get this. This punch-the-air moment feels like the culmination of so much of the show. Whereas humanity could only hope to fend the Gould off in small skirmishes before, the Lost City sees the Tauri finally meeting their enemies toe-to-toe -to -toe in open battle. Even so, it's still a close-run thing as SG-1 succeeds in unleashing an ancient weapon just in time to stop Anubis. However, like the previous season's full circle, the Lost City concludes on a triumphant but uncertain note as Jack O'Neill, overcome by the wealth of ancient knowledge in his mind, places himself in stasis. The others watch on, unsure if they'll ever see their friend again. Naturally, Jack O'Neill would return, albeit in a reduced capacity. Once again, Stargate SG-1 excelled in the ratings, and the Sci-Fi Channel commissioned an eighth season. However, Richard Dean Anderson was unsure about his return. At the time, the actor was raising a young daughter, and he grew concerned that his busy schedule filming SG-1 was taking too much time away from home. At the same time, Don S. Davis had to step away from the series entirely due to health concerns. While it was under less than ideal circumstances, this change in cast presented the showrunners with an option which would both accommodate Anderson's schedule while also serving the story. To explain Davis' departure, the showrunners gave General Hammond a promotion to leader of the Homeworld Security Department, leaving command of the SGC vacant. In the season opener, following a brief stint with civilian Dr. Elizabeth Weir in charge, more on her in a future video, Jack O'Neill is promoted to Brigadier General and made head of Stargate Command. This change allowed Richard Dean Anderson to remain on the show, but with far fewer shooting days. Season 8 has plenty of solid episodics, but there's a sense of looming finality to it all. The main characters are on their way to bigger and brighter things, and long-running villains The Trust, as well as recurring characters like Kinsey and Mayborn, are given suitable endings. And the go-old largely take a back seat to the far more dangerous impending threat of the Replicators, who manage to escape the time dilation trap in the season opener New Order. While the Replicators remain a dangerous and fascinating enemy, now led by a nanomachine clone of Samantha Carter, the Goa'uld arc gets quite muddled in Season 8. With Anubis defeated in the Lost City, we once again have a lone system lord conquering the others and threatening the galaxy. This time, it's Baal. However, Baal is only playing second fiddle to Anubis, who, as it turns out, survived the Battle of Antarctica and now hops from body to body in an energy form, not unlike Ra in the original movie. Anubis and Baal are effective villains, but their storylines in Season 8 feel like rehashes of ideas the show had already exhausted. Despite overstaying his welcome, Anubis's arc is brought to a conclusive end in the two-parter Reckoning. 
When the Replicators launch an attack on the galaxy, SG-1, the Tok'ra, and Free Jafar form an uneasy alliance with Baal in order to use an ancient superweapon to stop them. Reckoning is classic Stargate, firing on all cylinders. Big, spectacular storytelling where time is short, the action is epic, and the fate of the entire galaxy is at stake. My only criticism with Reckoning is that it shows us something which would have been great to see more of, the heroes and the villains teaming up to stop a more powerful enemy. The brief interactions between SG-1 and Baal are a delight to watch. Both sides take every opportunity to snipe at each other, even as the replicators close in. You know that bitter taste in your throat? It's kind of wrapped around your uvula. That's what's left of your pride. Perhaps you could curb your own amusement for a moment. The bristling chemistry between the actors and the charisma of Cliff Simon's performance did not go unnoticed by the showrunners, but more on that later. With this ultimate battle coming to a head on all fronts, Reckoning builds into an effective and intense climax. While Reckoning is the true climax of the season, the following episode, Threads, is the real denouement. It's akin to Babylon 5's Objects in Motion and Objects at Rest, in that rather than a grand epic showdown, Threads dedicates its runtime to saying a slow goodbye to this era of the show. Anubis is finally and definitively defeated at the hands of the Ascended. No. 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 And Carter says goodbye to her father, who tragically succumbs to illness and age. In its commitment to its sincerity, the episode also pays off a long-running inside joke set up all the way back in Season 3, by having Carter and the rest of SG-1 finally go fishing with O'Neill. This is great. I told you. I can't believe we didn't do this years ago. Yes, well, let's not dwell. There are no fish in this pond, are there? Nope. <laughs> While Threads is the heartwarming farewell to the show, the following two-parter, Mobius, is an extended epilogue which has a little more fun with itself. During a mission into the past, SG-1 unwittingly creates a new timeline in which the Stargate was never found on Earth, and therefore the previous eight years of adventures never happened. When this alteration is discovered via a videotape from the original timeline, the alternate versions of SG-1 must come together and repair their mistake. Mobius essentially functions as an extended look back at just how far the series has come. We re-encounter Teal as Apophis' first prime, and O'Neill still depressed over the loss of his son. Meanwhile, Daniel and Sam are ostracized intellectuals, having never had the confidence or the opportunity to showcase their brilliance. Amanda Tapping's performance as the socially awkward nerd version of Samantha Carter is especially amusing. And now, just because my reproductive organs are on the inside instead of the outside doesn't... God, that's horrible. Who would ever say that? These moments of fan service are nicely sprinkled in throughout the episode, including a payoff to the romantic tension between Carter and O'Neill. See, usually I'm a very cautious person and I tend to think things... And after this fun romp through time, SG-1 returns to where it left off, having satisfied both the characters and the fans. Didn't that tape say there were no fish in your pond? Close enough. 
If you're enjoying this video and you'd like to see more, consider liking the video and subscribing to the channel, or you can join me on Patreon. Making these kinds of feature-length videos takes a long time, which means long gaps between uploads, which the YouTube algorithm does not like. So if you want to help me make more videos like this, follow the link below to see retrospective reviews early, uncut, and ad-free. If you aren't able to, I appreciate you watching my work on YouTube all the same. Having finally defeated their long-time enemies, and the team ready to move on to other things, Mobius would seem like the perfect way to wrap up Stargate SG-1 for good. Richard Dean Anderson was no longer able to commit to even a reduced filming schedule, and Amanda Tapping was also starting a family by that point, and so her availability for future seasons was in doubt. It seemed logical to make Mobius the end of Stargate SG-1. In its place, executive producers Brad Wright and Robert C. Cooper toyed with the idea of a new spin-off show called Stargate Command. Such a show could continue using these standing sets and ready-made props and costumes, while bringing in new characters who could stand alongside any SG-1 cast members who wanted to come back. Michael Shanks and Christopher Judge were keen to reprise their roles for the new series, but Amanda Tapping was unsure at the time. It was clear some new blood was needed to fill out the rest of the ensemble. Taking over as base commander was Bo Bridges as General Hank Landry. Bo Bridges, son of Lloyd Bridges and brother to Jeff Bridges, had a decades-long acting career spanning stage and screen by the time he joined Stargate, and had already worked with Brad Wright in the pilot episode of The Outer Limits. Lexa Doig, known for playing the title role in the sci-fi series Andromeda, joined the cast as Dr. Caroline Lamb. Amanda Tapping finally confirmed she would be able to reprise the role of Samantha Carter, however she wouldn't be able to film the first six episodes of the season. Leading SG-1 would be a new character, Lieutenant Colonel Cameron Mitchell, played by Ben Browder. In a rather serendipitous turn of events, Browder would be joined by Claudia Black as recurring character Val Amaldoran. Ben Browder and Claudia Black were well known to fans of science fiction for their starring roles in Farscape. The series was famously cancelled after its fourth season, but later concluded in the miniseries The Peacekeeper Wars. It was during Farscape's hiatus that Wright and Cooper first broached the idea of a role on Stargate SG-1 to Ben Browder. Now that Farscape had concluded, Browder could finally take them up on their offer. Claudia Black's Vala had previously been introduced in the season 8 episode Prometheus Unbound. Her introductory scene is almost a parody of her first appearance in Farscape. Well, you kept the wrong guy, because I don't know anything about the ship. But you are very attractive. <coughs> what? Big guy, I'm, I'm, I'm flattered, really, I am. It's just that, uh, you're not my type. Uh, whoa, whoa, no, no, you don't have to do that. Don't, 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 don't. Don't worry, I'm not gonna hurt you. Thank God. Much. I hope. Although Vala would only return as a recurring character in Stargate Command, Claudia Black and Ben Browder both joining the series was a huge win for the new show. The show was still called Stargate Command quite far into production, with the title even being dropped in the opening scene of what would have been the premiere episode. Welcome to Stargate Command! But as production began, Wright and Cooper were receptive to MGM's suggestion of abandoning the Stargate Command show and simply rebranding it as Stargate SG-1 Season 9. This was a risky proposition, as for many fans, Richard Dean Anderson was the face of Stargate SG-1. Due to this rebrand, it appeared to some that fan-favourite Jack O'Neill had been replaced by a younger character who was, at first glance, a pale imitation of the wise-cracking action hero that fans knew and loved. Despite the abandoning of the Stargate Command series, Stargate SG-1 Season 9 functions as a soft reboot of the show. Cameron Mitchell is cleverly introduced as an audience surrogate character, a great admirer of SG-1 and their exploits, who is already tied into the mythology of the show as his character was present during the Battle of Antarctica. In some ways, it's the inverse of Jonas Quinn's introduction. 
Rather than framing the story from SG-1's perspective as they struggle to accept a new member, Season 9 begins by following Mitchell struggling to reunite SG-1, who have all moved on to other things. Carter now works at Area 51, Jackson is prepping to join the Atlantis expedition, and Teal'c has found a place among the leaders of the new Jaffa nation. Eventually, Mitchell's wish is granted when Vala arrives with an ancient tablet supposedly pointing the way to a vast treasure. The ensuing adventure puts SG-1 on a path to confront a powerful new enemy, the Ori. I won't beat around the bush here, so I'll just come out and state another controversial opinion. The Ori arc covering seasons 9 and 10 of Stargate SG-1 is, for me, the best part of the show. It takes all of the best bits of the Goa Old arc and builds them into something with higher stakes, richer drama, a grander scope, and more intriguing narrative ideas. And beyond the writing, there's a lot to like about the new cast. Personally, I am a huge Farscape fan, which shouldn't surprise longtime viewers of this channel, so it's a delight to see Ben Browder and Claudia Black together again in another sci-fi series. It's also worth noting that neither of their characters are carbon copies of their Farscape roles or cheap imitations of established Stargate characters some may perceive them to be replacing. Cameron Mitchell is not the discount version of Jack O'Neill many would assume him to be. While they do have some crossover in their sense of humour, Mitchell is far less confident. What if the world needs saving? Well, if the world needs saving, I will be there to do what I can. What if the world needs saving because I screwed up because you weren't here in the first place? He is defined by his near-death experience at the Battle of Antarctica, his fight to recover from his injuries, and the survivor's guilt he feels over those in his unit who didn't make it. He's a man out to prove himself, to others certainly, but himself mostly. Whereas O'Neill was eternally optimistic, Mitchell is terrified of failure, of letting himself down and the people around him. Mitchell's eternal battle to prove his worthiness makes him just as reckless as he is heroic. Okay, that thing is going to kill him. Okay, that's enough for today. No, I can do this. Mitchell's doggedness is also reinforced by his humour, whereas O'Neill's one-liners and sarcasm often came at the expense of the drama, Mitchell's sardonic remarks and big expressions helped to reinforce the drama. Ultimately, Cameron Mitchell is far more than a mere O'Neill stand-in, and quickly comes into his own as a distinct and interesting character, anchored by a fantastic performance from Browder. Meanwhile, Claudia Black is so memorable as Vala Maldoran that I always forget she isn't even a regular cast member until the following season. Vala fires off a ton of great lines in the first episode of the season. Thank you so much for the lovely greeting party. We all had a wonderful time searching each other, didn't we, boys? I know nothing about your fair planet, other than it seems to have a rather interesting, if somewhat limited, gene pool. And maintains this infectious charisma and humour in every subsequent episode she appears in. However, there are more layers to Vala than one might expect. As the former host of A Goa Old, Vala was hated and rejected by her homeworld and took up a life of crime to help herself because she believed no one else would. This is what makes her journey with SG-1 so compelling. At first, she joins them simply as a way to find more riches and amuse herself at the same time. But as the series goes on, Vala slowly opens up to the team, and while she maintains her sarky demeanour, it's clear she starts to care for them, and they for her. Other new cast members like Bo Bridges as General Landry and Lexa Doig as Dr. Lamb slot into the show just as smoothly. In many ways, they are the polar opposites of their predecessors. While Hammond was a stern commanding officer with a heart of gold underneath, Landry comes across as warm and friendly in a folksy kind of way. 
and in contrast to the nurturing Dr. Fraser, Dr. Lamb is more blunt and reserved. Later on, we discover her stout temperament may have a lot to do with her strained relationship with her father, who is General Landry himself. I spoke to Mom recently. All those years I was growing up, I resented the fact that you never told us anything about your work, about why you had to leave us for days, sometimes weeks at a time. But now, I'm beginning to understand how hard it must have been for you. Talking to mom the other day, I wanted to reassure her, to tell her everything, but I couldn't. It was hard. This kind of dramatic character conflict is woven into the new cast well without ever feeling forced or inappropriately angsty. It feels refreshing following the preceding seasons where the regular SG-1 ensemble became such a well-oiled machine that many scenes felt as though they were simply going through the motions. Seasons 9 and 10, however, are purposefully made to shake things up. After the typical Indiana Jones-style adventure of the two-parter Avalon, the following episode, Origin, changes gears when Jackson and Vala are unexpectedly transported to another galaxy. There, they discover a medieval-like society whose denizens worship an all-powerful pantheon of gods called the Ori. As antagonists, the Ori are an excellent example of power creep being used effectively. At first glance, the Ori are a repeat of the Goa'uld, alien beings who demand to be worshipped as gods and destroy all those who oppose them. However, what makes the Ori more interesting is that they truly seem godly. The Goa'uld were powerful, but much of their power can be ascribed to advanced technology, which any sci-fi fan will recognise. Spaceships, force fields, energy weapons, and so on. While they may have seemed all-powerful to those they oppressed, there was never any doubt in the minds of the main characters that what they were fighting were not gods. The Ori, however, are not only powerful in ways the characters cannot fully explain, but their Christian mythological inspiration means their impact hits far closer to home. Look, just because we know there is some beings on a higher plane of existence than ourselves does not mean there is not an order of being higher than them. At least I reckon that's what my grandma would say. I mean, uh, somewhere in there you gotta fill in the blanks with a little faith. I had a grandma too. Their esoteric might is aptly demonstrated when Vala is condemned as a heretic and chained up to be burned at the stake. At first, Vala maintains her sense of humour, and despite Daniel's struggles, the viewer is confident that a last-minute rescue will save Vala from the flames. I was trying to politely explain what was going on, and then his wife started screaming and accusing me of being overcome, at which point I believe I suggested she might want to think about procreation with herself. But as those flames draw closer, Vala's defences fall, and Jackson is reduced to pleading for her life. Okay, listen to me! Listen to me, you don't have to believe me! You're killing an innocent person! And in a shocking turn, the fire reaches Vala, and Daniel is forced to watch in horror as she burns to death. In the moment, there appears to be no getting out of this. No last-minute rescue, no wounds which can be healed, no alien medical technology to help her. For all intents and purposes, Vala is dead. This makes what follows feel genuinely miraculous. It's a clever way of introducing a new antagonist for the series, as in this moment they function as much-needed saviours. Their heavenly home in the city of Celestis may even lead a viewer to wonder if these godlike beings may not be intrinsically evil despite the extremism of their followers. That is, until the episode finally lets the curtain drop, revealing a pit of fire silhouetting the Ori's satanic herald and backed up by a score which sounds like it's been ripped right from the Omen soundtrack. In the name of the gods, ships shall be built to carry our warriors out amongst the stars and we will spread origin to all the unbelievers. Hallowed are the Ori, 
Hallowed are the Ori. Though an invasion is on the horizon, much of Season 9 depicts an ideological conflict across the galaxy, as the Priors of the Ori slowly convert more and more worlds to their religion. What makes this conflict so interesting is that it's largely centred on faith. The power of the Ori is undeniable, and despite SG-1's knowledge of what the Ori really are, they have no evidence to back it up. Furthermore, they have no way of effectively fighting back against the Ori, so any world that does resist is almost certain to perish. What follows is the prelude to a holy war, which includes plague, pestilence, and a swarm of almost locusts. The nuances, difficulties, and cost of this conflict are evident most in the episode Ethon. When an inhabitant of the planet Tigalis informs Stargate Command that his nation has sided with the Ori in exchange for a superweapon they can use to attack their Cold War rival, the Tauri decide to step in with disastrous consequences. What makes the conflict in this episode so difficult to resolve is how desperate each faction is. All sides are driven by fear, fear for their survival and fear of the other. In a rare turn for the show, Ethon is a narrative where characters are swept along by larger events, unable to make significant change. Attempts at manipulating either side of the planet's Cold War or to destroy the Ori superweapon fail utterly. The gauntlet is truly thrown down when the Ori weapon destroys the Prometheus, Earth's first starship and a symbol of how far the Tauri have advanced. Though only a minor recurring character, seeing the ship's commander Colonel Pendergast go down with his ship is devastatingly effective. Fire the weapon! Wait! No! Even after Daniel Jackson manages to pull off a miracle in quelling the conflict, the episode eschews Stargate SG-1's usual upbeat ending. So I take it then you haven't heard. Soon after we left, the talks broke down. And? And we've been unable to make contact with them. General Landry had the Daedalus reroute on its way back from Atlantis. The Stargate is presumed buried in the rubble. In the season finale, Camelot, the Ori launch a full-scale invasion of the galaxy using a supergate. The Tauri and their allies decide to muster all their strength and meet the Ori head-on. Camelot makes the ultimate statement of Ori power by completely pulling the rug out from under the audience. Echoing Season 8's reckoning, Earth, its allies, and some enemies all gather together in one massive fleet to stand against their common foe. From here, viewer expectations are obvious. A desperate but epic battle against the Ori ships, and when all hope seems lost, Teal'c will swoop in at the last minute with much-needed reinforcements to turn the tide. The climactic battle of the episode fits this structure to a T, but only to prime the viewer for when the episode breaks with this structure. Rather than a triumphant victory, Camelot sees Earth and its allies suffer a crushing defeat. The fate of every major character is left uncertain, and Vala is left standing at the heart of the horrors to come. With the Ori invasion now in full swing, Season 10 expands the conflict into a full-scale war, which puts the Tauri and their allies on the back foot from the first episode. Despite all of SG-1 surviving the pivotal battle of the Supergate, it's clear they have no hope of matching the Ori in open battle. It isn't long before the Ori's relentless war machine conquers both the Jaffa homeworld of Chulak and their capital Dakara. In order to turn the tide, SG-1 embarks on another Indiana Jones-style treasure hunt, facing down a living, fire-breathing dragon, and even meeting the wizard Merlin in the flesh. You look familiar. Melody. 
Oh my dear, it's been too long. While the Ori continue to be the primary threat of the series, Season 10 is also where the former Goa'uld system lord, Baal, really cements himself as a fan-favorite villain. Baal was first introduced all the way back in the Season 5 episode, Summit, and made another notable appearance in Season 6's Abyss. Do you not know the pain you will suffer for this impudence? I don't know the meaning of the word. Seriously. Impudence, what does that mean? Like many Goa'uld characters at the time, Baal came with an interesting design and posed a unique physical threat, but wasn't all that interesting as a character. Over the course of his subsequent appearances, however, this began to change. Unlike most other system lords, Baal's demeanor was far more passive-aggressive than megalomaniacal, and his modus operandi was more subtle and insidious. However, most of the character's success can be attributed to actor Cliff Simon, whose charisma was enough to make him stand out as a villain, even when the character was initially written in a more typical way. The character's enduring quality is cemented further by the existence of his seemingly endless clones. No matter how many times SG-1 captures, kills, or humiliates Baal, he always comes back with that same wry smile, hiding yet another elaborate plan to trap the main characters. While Baal makes several great appearances this season, particularly in the two-parter The Quest... I need your help. <laughs> well, that's hardly surprising. I know where you come from, you're considered relatively intelligent, but by galactic standards, that's not really saying much. Wouldn't you agree? His best outing comes in the episode Insiders. When Baal's ship crash lands on Earth, he informs SG-1 that his clones have turned against him, and in exchange for wiping them out, he will give them the location of an ancient superweapon capable of destroying the Ori. However, the balls the team come across all claim to be the original, and all claim SG-1 are walking into a trap. The episode is a terrific showcase of Baal's unique strengths as a character. As each new Baal is captured, SG-1's attempts to figure out exactly who's who and what they're planning become increasingly convoluted in the best way. Also, the episode has plenty of fun with puns. Chief, got a full count. Two strikes, three balls. I understand you got yourself a few extra balls. Those are the balls? More like dots, really. Eventually, the other shoe drops, revealing that SG-1 rounding up all of the balls to figure out Ball's plan was in fact Ball's plan all along. After a tense standoff inside the SGC, the balls escape, having slipped through SG-1's fingers yet again. It's an episode which keeps the viewer guessing until the very end, packed with humor, sprinkled with action, and more than enough ball for your buck. He was thinking that one up the whole way home. Season 10 also marked a huge milestone for the series, as it officially became the longest-running American science fiction show ever at the time. In celebration of this achievement, Stargate SG-1's 200th episode is truly something to behold. When Martin Lloyd, creator of the series Wormhole Extreme, which is loosely based on SG-1's actual missions, arrives at Stargate Command to ask for notes on a new movie script, the ensuing dramatized pitches send the episode rocketing into stratospheric meta-heights. If the previous 100th episode celebration was SG-1 winking to the audience, 200 is the show putting on a full-blown party for itself. With the framing device established in the pre-credits teaser, No one does that anymore. You just throw up the title and get on with it. I mean, with the framing device established in the pre-title card teaser, the episode shows its hand as simply an excuse to put on a parade of sketches, parodies, and fourth wall breaks, all the while the cast and crew seem like they're having a blast. In a Mobius strip level inside joke, the episode even parodies Farscape with Claudia Black reprising her role as Erin Sun. Pharrell. Oh, son of a hazmat! Shots! But my personal favorite sketch is the Thunderbirds inspired segment with puppetry created by the crew from Team America. If each symbol represents a specific point in space, then six of them would create a sort of box. The intersection point between those six points would indicate a destination. Maybe, just maybe, the seventh marks the starting point. 
While SG-1 has always had its tongue slightly in cheek, 200 is the show fully throwing off all pretenses and simply embracing the silliness of the sci-fi genre and television production. As a viewer, you simply have to surrender yourself to the absurdity and embrace the fun. Indeed. To P.I. Coming this fall. Having had its fourth wall breaking fun in 200, the rest of SG-1 season 10 continues to deliver great material in the Ori arc, now primarily centred on the character Adria, played by a post-Firefly Marina Baccarin. As excellent as the Ori arc is, one area where it could have delivered more is in the relationship between Vala and Adria. Adria sees Vala as her mother, as Vala did give birth to her, however this was not a natural pregnancy, and from another perspective, Vala was merely used as a vessel by the Ori to birth what is essentially the Space Antichrist. Okay, we all know, darling, that you have telekinetic powers. You can stop showing off now. As mentioned before, Vala begins the show afraid of growing attached to anyone and instead keeps her relationships superficial. This is what makes her relationship with Adria so difficult, because on some level Vala clearly does think of Adria as her daughter, but she's unable to get close to her due to the whole aforementioned space antichrist thing. The dramatic tension between the two of them flares up in a few episodes, but I've always felt the dynamic between these two characters could have been mined for even richer material. The latter half of the season sees SG-1 using an ancient weapon to destroy the Ori, and in the penultimate episode a mortally wounded Adria fights to ascend before her death. It's a solid episode, but I've always wished for a bigger emotional payoff to Vala and Adria's arc in this episode. I always wondered if you had it in you to kill me. <laughs> Goodbye, Mother. Despite SG-1's success in destroying the Ori and their herald gone from the galaxy, the Ori conflict is still far from over. Unfortunately, this was a conflict cut suddenly short when the production team learned that the Sci-Fi Channel had decided to cancel Stargate SG-1. The Sci-Fi Channel's reasons for this have never been made entirely clear. Many news outlets speculated about declining ratings and rising production costs, but Sci-Fi Channel themselves stated their reason was not ratings-based and have never explained further. News of the show's cancellation came well into Season 10's production, completely blindsiding the cast, crew and fans alike. Ironically, the production team had been anticipating the end of the show since Season 6, and had written every subsequent season finale to function as a potential series finale at the same time. It was thanks to the show's success on the Sci-Fi Channel that SG-1 continued for so long. And yet, just when the showrunners had gotten comfortable enough to expect an 11th season, that's when the axe fell. After Sci-Fi cancelled the series, Brad Wright and Robert C. Cooper tried to find a new home for SG-1, eventually drumming up interest from Apple, who suggested turning the show into a web series exclusive to iTunes. However, a non-compete clause in MGM's contract with Sci-Fi prevented the deal going through. The Stargate SG-1 abruptly ended with the season 10 finale unending. While under heavy attack from Ori motherships, Carter activates an Asgard time dilation device, which slows down time aboard the Odyssey long enough for Carter to find a solution to escape destruction. What was meant to be a matter of weeks frozen in time, turns to years, decades, and potentially to the end of the team's very lives. Unending is a strange and solemn note to end the series on. Rather than an epic battle to save the galaxy or an Indiana Jones-style romp through an ancient alien temple, the episode simply spends time with this found family as they live out the rest of their lives in their little bubble of time. Of course, it's inevitable that Carter finds a way out of their predicament, reversing time back to the moment before the team became trapped, but the strength of the story comes from watching these characters grow in ways they never could in the regular series. 50 or 60 years? Something interesting must have happened. Obviously, I hooked up with someone. Was it you, Muscles? It can't have been Mitchell, can it? General Landry? 
and in its final scene, Unending lives up to its title by having SG-1 step through the Stargate one more time for further adventures. Because, in truth, this would not be the end of Stargate. Just another everyday mission to save the galaxy, sir. Indeed. Godspeed. There's something eternal about Stargate SG-1, which is strange considering its contemporary setting and close association with a mid-90s feature film. Yet SG-1 is not a snapshot of a bygone era of television or film the way some other science fiction shows are. It began as such in its early days, but the show quickly developed into something else. It became a show about change, about discovery, about exploration. Ironically, despite the change in creative direction to a pulp action-adventure series, Stargate SG-1 overall represents the themes and ideas which so captivated me when I first saw the original movie. Stargate SG-1 was seemingly the one sci-fi series which could survive anything. It could be cancelled and then revived elsewhere, major cast members could depart, return and then depart again, and the series wouldn't suffer because of it. And no matter how many planets SG-1 visited, there was always more adventure waiting just beyond the event horizon. And Stargate would continue for a time, in a new form, in a new medium, in a new galaxy. Thank you for watching, and for those who may be asking, what about the Ark of Truth? What about Continuum? Those movies will be covered in the next part of this series, along with Stargate Atlantis. That may seem like an odd grouping, but once part 4 comes out, you'll see why I thought it was more appropriate to cover the movies there. If you've enjoyed this video, please like and subscribe to make sure you catch the next video in the series. These feature-length videos take a long time to make, and the YouTube algorithm doesn't look kindly on big gaps between uploads. So if you like what I do, consider joining my Patreon to tell the YouTube algorithm where it can shove it. Speaking of which, I'd like to thank my patrons and members whose names are currently scrolling by, with an ultra thanks to Retro PC Gamer, Benjamin Stokes, Hiroshi the Dog, Movie Magic, Charles Borsum, Olivia Computer, Bano, Dent the Air, Extreme Streamers, Tom, Dusk, Colin Camille, Patrick Fleming, Matthew Camille, Ed Mark Starr, Dylan Thomas, Lilac Yane, Howard Craig Akervik, and KJG. Thank you once again for watching. Have a good one, and I'll see you next time.